I wanted to talk a little bit about your violin. So you play on a Guarneri del Jesu violin, and you used to play on a Stradivari violin. A lot of people have heard of Stradivari, but fewer have heard of del Jesu. Tell me a little bit about your violin and how the Mendelssohn may be factored a little in your choice of that violin. I always thought of myself as being maybe more suited to, to Strads, to the uh, Stradivari violins which tend to be a little bit maybe more brilliant and bright in the sound. Um, the sound production is quite, the response is very fast, very easy. It seemed to, I thought it suited me quite well. Then one day I met this violin, the, the Granelli del Gesù. Yes, these two makers are sort of considered maybe among, I mean, at least for violins, it's different for cellos and yeah, other instruments, but for violins to be the two greatest makers, they were both in the same city around the same time. Uh, Del Gesù did not live as long, so he didn't make as many violins, and they're quite uh, different from one another. So not all of them are um, at the, maybe at the very top level, but he did make a, a lot of extraordinary violins that tend to be a little bit sort of warmer in sound, a little bit sort of richer, earthier, uh, perhaps. And um, whereas this uh, Stradivari sound ideal was a little bit more this sort of brilliant sound, less less round and less, maybe a little bit less warmth. But that's a generalization because you do sometimes find strats that go also in this direction. Sure. And, and this is actually happens to be a Del Gesù that um, is actually quite brilliant in the, on the top register. So it's not quite so clear cut always. But when I, when I saw this violin, um, basically I was offered this, this loan. And it's a very famous one because it was played by Hendrik Schering, the, the Polish virtuoso that in this, who in the second half of the 20th century was you know just a major figure and I had many of his recordings growing up and and he played on this violin for for 30 years and recorded most of his recordings on it and I remember uh, listening to his recordings I also remember that there was once a poster of this violin in uh, I think it was in Strag magazine they used to have these center folds basically but <laughs> they were violins fold of a violin. <laughs> but they were violins I remember looking at that and it was this one Wait, how old is this violin? Just so we know. Like okay, so it was made in 1744, and uh, they think it's uh, one of the last ones, or perhaps the last one he, he, he made before Whoa. he died. So it's a little bit after Stradivarius died. Uh, that would have been in the 30s, his last violin, early, early 1730s. He's referred to as Del Gesù. Uh, his, his, his real name is Giuseppe Guarneri, but his father was also Giuseppe Guarneri. So to distinguish him, they call him Del Gesù, and it's uh, because he, on, on the labels, he would put a cross, like it was the Jesuit symbol that you put on the label. The label is inside, inside the violin. Inside the violin, yes. Okay, yeah. The thing though is, it was not really meant as like a religious signal. It's more, it's actually basically a calling card, mm. the label. The idea was, if you saw this violin and you liked it, you would look inside the label and you would see made in Cremona and you would see this thing, uh, the Jesuit sy symbol, you would then go to Cremona to the Jesuit church and opposite the church was a shop. So, <laughs> It just like basically told you where to find them, oh. but you won't find a shop there now, obviously. <laughs> but, but that's sort of how he came by this by this nickname. I saw this violin. I was blown away by the beauty of the sound. You know, it was very different from the Strad I had before, mm -hmm. and it's true that the Mendelssohn Concerto was one of the things that convinced me because the theme of the second movement, which is played on the A string, I sometimes felt on the Strad, it didn't quite have the like warmth, the, the kind of sound that I was imagining. When I tried it on this violin, I felt like, oh, that's, 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 that's it. I, I, could, I could sense it, even though I, I wasn't used to the violin yet. I, I felt like it's there. I can, I can finally maybe get, get to it. I was having then so much fun just by basically playing through parts of the repertoire that yeah. that's kind of what convinced me. Um, it, because it's a difficult step when you change a violin, especially between these two makers, because the violins are so, it's a, it's a very different way of making violins then you have to also change your playing quite a lot. Mm. And um, I used to basically play with, a, I, I have to basically play with much more energy in my right arm and kind of like more, it's, it's a more physical process yeah. because you need basically more um, strength to get the sound out of the violin. Mm -hmm. Many adjustments that I had to make, but it was the sound that, that sort of drew me in this direction, yeah. That particular shift up on the A string on this violin just had a certain natural way of singing that I found on this chat quite, quite
quite hard because the sound was, was very, very sort of pristine and, and focused and didn't quite just sing in such a relaxed way. And that was, I think, the, um, yeah, so that was one of the moments. That was really beautiful. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Definitely can see why he wanted that violin. But then I'm pretty sure it sounded beautiful on the Strat as well. So what is it like to play the Mendelssohn Concerto or any other concerto with a group like Leiko, with a chamber orchestra, um, rather than like a full orchestra? The, basically, the, fo the forces of the orchestra are smaller, mm -hmm. and they're used to playing in a smaller configuration. A chamber orchestra usually doesn't play you know, the, the Mahler symphonies. You know, they, they're used to playing this kind of repertoire repertoire from the classical and sort of early romantic periods and then there's a few other things that are mm -hmm. small enough in size but um, basically the fact that they always play this way makes them makes chamber orchestra players often listen to each other a certain a certain way and because you have fewer players they tend to maybe also give a little more of them of themselves a little bit of more energy so there are certain things that um, I like very much when it's, when it's Beethoven Concerto or Mendelssohn, particularly when it's like a Mozart Concerto. With a chamber orchestra, I find it is a little bit more, the ensemble can sometimes be more nimble and it can, the communication sort of more direct because they are used to sitting close together and making music in such a close, direct way with each other. I think that's probably the the yeah the main draw of the chamber orchestra experience but then of course the repertoire is more limited it's actually just in, in the violin repertoire i feel like it's just when it gets really good that you already reach the end of the chamber music repertoire so already mendelssohn has like more wins than like many chamber orchestras you know like yeah. like would want to use and and then eventually you get to the point where you know composers ask for four horns and then or, or and, and then there's a trombone and then it becomes like eventually eventually reached a point when it's too big for a chamber orchestra. Yeah. I think Mendelssohn works quite well with fewer people actually, yeah. not, not as many string players, and then each person kind of playing their part a little bit more soloistically. Uh, there's a certain intensity that the piece gets uh, that I rather like, yeah. Yeah, well, and you came to Los Angeles about, what was it, 10 years ago and played the Beethoven Concerto yes. with Leiko, and what are your memories of that? And you know, what makes it special to come to Los Angeles? I love coming in LA, as, uh, but it's especially when it's uh, you know it's already quite cold, like in the rest <laughs> of the country. And I come here, and it's so nice and warm and sunny. And where, where is it that you so live, actually? I live in Connecticut now, you know, uh, close to New Haven. It is still not very far away from New York City, but before I was living for over fifteen years in in New York City. So I still, still kind of think of myself as a New Yorker sometimes. But uh, last time, yeah, last time I came, I was definitely still living in, in New York. So yeah, I, lo I love coming to LA. And I have great memories of my last time with Leiko, um, with the Beethoven. Yes, it was a very fresh uh, p performance because it did, it, it did not have the sort of like large symphonic quality to it, but was more kind of a little bit more classical in the, the approach. You've worked with Jaime Martin before, not with Leco, doing a European tour? Yes. Or? Originally, um, it, it was a tour that um, Neville Mariner, so Neville, Neville Mariner was supposed to conduct it. He was someone I worked with a number of times, but then, but then he died just before this, this mm -hmm. tour. But Jaime Martin was the music director of the orchestra, of this um, Cadaqués orchestra in uh, Barcelona. He stepped in and conducted very beautifully, I remember. And we played Beethoven and Mendelssohn actually on the tour, sort of kind of alternating. And on one of the concerts, uh, Jaime could not make it, and we did it without conductor. Um, but then I was thinking afterwards, it, it worked very well, but it worked very well because we had just rehearsed it with him and performed it with him. And, you know, there was something, there was a, there was a special, I don't know, there was a special energy he brought to the piece that I enjoyed a lot. Yeah, I'm very excited to see him again. Augustin, it's been great to talk with you about your violin, about the Mendelssohn, and I look forward to when we talk again. Me too, it was so great to see you again. Thank you.